It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Manning Marival as our Du Bois lecturer. He is one of the great scholars of our day, one of the great activists of our day. Dr. Marival is Professor of Public Affairs, Political Science, and History at Columbia University. He's also the director of the newly established Center for Contemporary Black History at Columbia. I'll just wait for the group to come in. He is also the director of the newly established Center for Contemporary Black History at Columbia. From 1993 to 2003, he served as the founding director of Columbia's Institute for Research in African American Studies. His scholarship is far reaching, covering a vast array of subjects and appealing to a large and diverse audience. His trenchant critiques of black leadership, the academy, and American race relations appear in both academic journals and the popular press. He is a prolific writer, publishing more than 250 journal articles. He has also, for nearly 30 years now, written a political commentary entitled Along the Color Line, which appears in some 400 newspapers and journals worldwide. Time does not permit me to name all of his books and scholarly anthologies. His book, The Great Wells of Democracy, The Meaning of Race in American Life, was published by Basic Books in 2003. Other books authored by Manning Marable, and they seem to appear every year, are Black Leadership, 1998, Black Liberation in Conservative America, 1997, Speaking Truth to Power, 1996, Beyond Black and White, 1995, Race Reform and Rebellion, The Second Reconstruction in Black America, 1945 to 1990, and that's published 1991. He has also edited major anthologies. In 2003, he was the general editor of Freedom on My Mind, the Columbia Documentary History of the African American Experience, he co-edited with Leith Mullings, Let Nobody Turn Us Around, Voices of Resistance, Reform and Renewal, and African American Anthology in 2000. My personal favorite of his edited books is entitled Dispatches from the Ebony Tower, Intellectuals Confront the African American Experience, which also came out in 2000. I won't even list the books earlier than that. Manning Marable's professional life has been one committed to linking the academy and the community in order to address the critical social issues of poverty, incarceration, racial inequality, and legal justice. He is currently editing an anthology of historical writings by black scholars and prisoners on racism in the criminal justice system. In addition, one of the programs at his Center for Contemporary Black History is the Africana Criminal Justice Project, which focuses on strategies to empower ex-prisoners and communities devastated by mass incarceration. In his role as scholar activist, as a writer of books and op-ed articles, as a teacher of the privileged students at Columbia and a teacher of the incarcerated at Sing Sing Prison, Manning Marable leaves us all with penetrating questions that we must all find answers to. He writes in The Great Well of Democracy, and I quote him, it is this paradox of integration, the apparently inescapable contradiction that the stronger we become, the less leverage we seem to have as a group that has forced black Americans to search for alternative models for renegotiating the political reality of race. If not electoral politics, then what? And another one of his great questions. And I quote him again. Can we imagine an American society with a national commitment to eliminating the major racialized deficits that separate blacks and whites into their respective universes in life expectancy, health care access, college enrollments, quality public education. Manning Marable keeps before us the questions. Ultimately, 
Can We Envision a Better World? His scholarship and activism admonish us to question the socioeconomic status, to challenge our own assumptions and our institutions, and to act with new vision. In a critique of Spike Lee's movie on Malcolm X, Manning Marable wrote, and I quote him again, to genuinely honor Malcolm X is to extend his political and ideological search into the struggles of inequality, racism, and economic oppression, which define black liberation today. I believe Manning Marable's work honors Malcolm X, and we eagerly await his presentation today, Black History on the Auction Block, Preserving Malcolm X's Le Legacy. Let us welcome Manning Marable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind and generous introduction. What happens, what happens to a movement or within a culture when its most celebrated heroes are transformed into corporate commodities? Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. have both in many ways become commercial brands or logos, not unlike Nike and Coca-Cola. Their names evoke instant, almost universal recognition, like Michael Jordan and Oprah. Their visual images and words, when reproduced in marketed commercial materials, create substantial revenue in the form of royalties. The intellectual property rights and the value generated are considerable. But what is the relationship between the product we consume versus the actual content of their character? What are the long-term political consequences for African Americans as a people when Malcolm's provocative phrase, by any means necessary, can be appropriated as the last sentence delivered in the film The X-Men? in the rush to become so thoroughly and completely American. How much has been lost and what has been surrendered? These were some of the rambling thoughts I had on the morning of January 7th, 2003, when two of Malcolm's daughters, Adela Shabazz and Malak Shabazz, stood before the media cameras in the theater of Harlem's historic Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture to announce that they were turning over the largest known cache of their father's personal papers and, rela and re related memorabilia to that branch of the New York Public Library. Standing proudly beside the Shabazz daughters was the, Sh was the Schomburg Center's dapper, well-dressed director Howard Dodson, who declared, quote, the new collection is an extraordinary treasure trove. On display were two large wooden crates weighing a total of 697 pounds, which had contained most of the rare documents. Dodson provided only sketchy details about the full contents of the new acquisition which included Malcolm's personal diaries kept during his 1964 travels to Africa and the Middle East, as well as hundreds of, of speech and sermon manuscripts and photographs. Quote, this is his record of his thought, Dodson informed the audience. This is what he has written. The edits he has made on the speeches and his radio program and all the rest, this is his voice. Dotson announced that while the Malcolm X collection would remain the property of the Shabazz family, it would be generously on loan to the New York Public Library for the next 75 years. Dotson estimated that after cataloging and preserving work was complete, the collection would be made available to scholars and the general public sometime 
by mid-2003. I'm looking at my watch <laughs> to see when this stuff becomes available. Neither Dotson nor the Shabazz Estates attorney, my old friend Joe Fleming, Joseph Fleming, threw light on the highly unusual circumstances that had brought this significant cache of primary source materials to the Schomburg. Only two of the six daughters of Malcolm X and his wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz, were in attendance. Notably absent was Malika Shabazz, one of Malcolm's twin daughters, who was widely reported to have placed these rare documents in a Florida storage locker where they had nearly been destroyed. But for the historian of the African-American experience, the most obvious and disturbingly unanswered question was why it had taken the Shabazz estate nearly 40 years since the assassination of Malcolm X to begin the process of archiving and preserving his intellectual legacy. On the face of things, it made absolutely no sense. Dr. Shabazz, who after her husband's death acquired a doctorate of education from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, certainly was aware of the historic and financial value of her husband's intellectual property. Some of Dr. Shabazz's closest friends were prominent scholars, most notably C. Eric Lincoln and John Henry Clark, who would have been willing and fully qualified to initiate the process of building a national Malcolm X archive. My initial impression at the time was that the series of terribly traumatic events over the years had shattered their lives, the firebombing of their home, Malcolm X's assassination in 1965, the bizarre arrest of Kabila Shabazz for plotting the murder of Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, and the tragic death of Shabazz in 1997 from injuries sustained in an apartment fire set by her grandson, little Malcolm Shabazz, then only 12 years old, made it too difficult for Dr. Shabazz or her children to authorize the consolidation and archiving of Malcolm's intellectual legacy. In the early 1990s, Columbia University and Dr. Shabazz reached an agreement to preserve and restore part of the Audubon Ballroom in Upper Manhattan, the site of Malcolm X's assassination. The entire project, with a total price tag of $19 million, restored the site. By the way, there's a very nice piece in the Times today on Max Bond, a good friend, great architect, African-American lead architect. He will be on the rebuilding of the site at 9-11, uh, who was in charge of the restoration of the Aldabon, which technically opened in late October 1995. Dr. Shabazz had planned to develop the site as a memorial to her husband's life and work and authorized a magnificent, you should see it, a magnificent statue of Malcolm, of Brother Malcolm, on the first floor of the building at the new entrance as you come in off of Broadway between West 165th and 166th. A preliminary board of advisors was established with Dotson and the Schomburg assigned to assume a major role. An educational link with Medgar Evers College, a two-year institution within the City University of New York system located in Brooklyn was explored. This is where Dr. Shabazz was an administrator. With Dr. Shabazz's death, however, the memorial site never materialized. Today, the Audubon Ballroom, located in a multi-million dollar building, still remains vacant and closed to the public. There's a guard who sits, who's paid to sit at the front entrance and I won't channel on this, but I can go off, who sits at the front entrance 
of a locked building reading a newspaper and eating, you know, burgers from Burger King, who's paid by the city to watch a vacant building. It's only been opened about a dozen times since its completion in 1995. It remains closed and vacant, inaccessible to the public, in December 1999, Ilyasa Shabazz, Malcolm's third oldest daughter, came to my office at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University, requesting my assistance in getting the city and my university to pool their resources to finance the Memorial Center. For several years, I had met with representatives of the Giuliani administration, city officials, and my university administrators, to help facilitate these negotiations. No one was financially willing to assume principal responsibility for this project. Any commitments or promises that had been made orally to Betty Shabazz before her terrible death were either forgotten, ignored, or denied. Now, perhaps because there exists no physical site, or institutions, or memorials, housing large numbers of documents and primary source materials by and related to Malcolm X, a tremendous speculative market has grown, mushroomed, among private collectors for his memorabilia. One of the first indications of just how lucrative Malcolm X's market could be was about a decade ago in March 1993, when the carbon typescript of the autobiography of Malcolm X was offered for sale by Swan Galleries in Los Angeles. The typescript plus letters between Haley, Mal Alex Haley and Malcolm X was given a pre-sale value of only $300 to $400. $400. It sold for nearly $6,000. Then in May 1999, the small red personal diary that Malcolm had on his person when he was shot showed up at a San Francisco auction house, Butterfields, the nation's third largest auction house, was offering the diary for a pre-sale value of upwards to $50,000. The unidentified seller had told Butterfields that he had purchased the 146-page diary in the early 90s from a sale of items from the New York Police Department. Supposedly, the diary seized by police at the murder scene ended up being logged, stored, and then subsequently forgotten in the city's municipal archives. Attorney Joseph Fleming, acting on the family's behalf, was able to stop the sale. In June of 1999, the FBI launched its own investigation focusing on the likelihood that the diary having been stolen property had been transported across interstate lines. The FBI subsequently served a subpoena for some of the stored documents related to Malcolm X's murder. After an intensive investigation in January 2000, it was determined that a court clerk had purloined the diary back in 1991. The clerk reportedly had held the diary for about six years and sold it to a dealer of memorabilia for about $5,000. The Shabazz family subsequently recovered their father's diary. Inexplicably, however, the family failed to take corrective measures at that time to consolidate or inventory the remaining materials related to their father that were still in their direct possession. The theft and attempt to auction Malcolm's diary triggered a new level of anxiety among one or more members of the family. What is known, or what I'm willing to tell you at the time, at this time, is that in late April or early May, in 1999, a huge cache of invaluable items related to both Malcolm and Betty were taken from the family home. 
Nearly all of these items had never been seen or appraised by scholars or archivists, although we suspected that they were there. A partial list, just a partial list of items taken include the private journals of Malcolm X's two trips to the Mideast and Africa in 1964. By themselves, they probably constitute a second volume of the autobiography of Malcolm X. A copy of Malcolm's Holy Quran outlines and texts of Malcolm's speeches, including the basic draft for the ballot or the bullet, delivered originally in Cleveland, Ohio, on April the 3rd, 1964. Personal letters to his wife, his brother Philbert, other family members, and a significant photographic archive. Malcolm loved taking pictures. He always had a camera with him. My favorite photo of Malcolm is a photograph of Malcolm taking a photograph of Muhammad Ali, the night he won the heavyweight championship. On May 17, 1999, according to court records, the youngest of Malcolm and Betty's children, Malika Shabazz Brown, signed a contract to rent space in a storage facility near Orlando. The materials transported from the family home were stored there for more than two years. The California-based owner of the Florida facility, Public Storage Incorporated, PSI, later claimed that Malika had failed to maintain the rent payments on the storage bin. The account was $600 in arrears. PSI determined that Shabazz Brown had defaulted on the contractual agreement, seized the locker's contents, scheduled to put them up for sale on September 20, 2001. Now technically, according to Florida state law, a renter must receive a 15-day notice between initial notification of a sale and the actual sale date of the items. However, Brown's first notice of the impending sale is dated the 7th of September, 2001, only 13 days in advance of the actual sale. As Fleming later observed, those two days should have made the sale null and void. The Shabazz properties were purchased for the modest sum, $600, by a man named in the court documents as James Calhoun. Calhoun reportedly offered the materials to Butterworth's auction house, which agreed to do the public sale. An expensive-looking, colorful brochure was produced, highlighting the valuable features of the collection. Then in February 2002, Butterfields announced the pending sale of the Malcolm X collection estimating its pre-sale value at between $300,000 to $500,000. Two public preview displays of the documents were scheduled in Los Angeles on May 8th through 10th and in San Francisco on, on, sorry, on March 8th through 10th in San Francisco on March 15th through 17th, 2002, with the sale taking place on March 20th, 2002. The materials were subdivided and inventoried into 21 lots and marketed at different price ranges on eBay. What outraged historians, particularly about the pending sale, was the sloppy and inaccurate description of the items indicating that no scholar familiar with the documents had been consulted and that no opportunity to assess or appraise their authenticity had been given. Most, if not all, of the immediate members of the Shabazz household, to my knowledge, had not been notified or even consulted prior to the announcement of the sale. Indeed, I personally informed Ilyasa about the pending sale in a telephone conversation. When the Butterfields auction was announced to the public, there was a firestorm of criticism in the media both in the United States and internationally. At the LA preview display, Butterfield's employees permitted potential buyers to handle these rare documents without gloves or any other precautions. Observers were shocked to find many of these irreplaceable items to be severely yellowed and brittle. 
indicating that they had been stored haphazardly at best without regard for any climate-controlled environment. During the period of several frantic days, several major research universities and libraries independently approached Butterfields with the intention to purchase the entire block of items to maintain them in, in a coherent collection, which would then be preserved and then made available to scholars and the general public. Now, I happened to be in San Francisco when Butterfields announced its pending auction. I held several conversations with its representatives. Butterfields demanded a generous commission of 17% of the sale price of the property, which roughly pushed the total sale price to $600,000. I had fully anticipated that several major research universities undoubtedly would be putting together bids. In fact, a close friend who was at that time director of a prestigious African American Studies Institute <laughs> at another Ivy League institution <laughs> casually informed me that he was prepared to go $800,000 and even up to a million if necessary to secure this potential treasure trove for his university. Now my immediate response was to seek the Columbia administration's direct support to purchase Malcolm's archives. I immediately went to the office of Provost Jonathan Cole, then Provost. I explained the situation, and to his credit, in 15 minutes, he gave me a commitment of $600,000 and a promise of more money if I needed it. But then I reflected about the issue, the matter. Upon reflection, I wondered whether becoming an active participant in a bidding war was the best way, the most appropriate way, to preserve Malcolm's legacy. Logically, the archive of Malcolm needed to be located in New York City, not Cambridge, <laughs> and preferably housed in Harlem the community he knew best and loved. That would mean brokering a deal with the Schomburg and the New York Public Library in partnership with Columbia. Provost Cole and James Neal, Columbia's chief of all libraries, concurred with my assessment. Several days later, I met with Howard Dotson for breakfast at Small's Restaurant in Harlem, Malcolm's favorite place. After some initial pleasantries, we got down to business. Dotson and I shared a common intellectual history. Nearly 30 years before, he had been executive director of the small but vibrant Institute of the Black World, IBW, an independent black think tank based in Atlanta. And in the mid to late 70s, I was an affiliated scholar with IBW a young, radical scholar activist teaching at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Dotson seemed to accept a tentative agreement of sorts. Columbia would finance the entire acquisition. The bulk of the property would be housed and displayed at the Schomburg. Columbia and African American Studies would then digitize a subset of research materials and core correspondence, make that available, and we would do most of the archiving and preservation. Dawson curiously never got back to me, but I subsequently learned that the New York Public Library's executive bureaucracy has a long, and to be fair to the New York Public Library, a very based on their own history with Columbia, a contentious history with Columbia University, which made any such deal that Howard and I cut at the level we are at almost impossible to carry out. Finally, on March the 12th, 2002, the pending sale came to an abrupt halt when PSI filed a suit in L.A. Superior Court requesting legal clarification of the charges of 
irregularities involved in the acquisition and sale of the properties. Butterfields call it its own sale, announcing to the press that it had, quote, received additional information via third parties, revealing a possible irregularity in the process of transfer of title prompting the archives removal from sale until the issue can be resolved. In recognition of the exceptional scholarly and historical value of this collection, Butterfields has been engaged in extensive discussions with a number of public and private libraries in the hope of negotiating a private party sale for the entire collection." Unquote. Butterfields executives, stung by the nearly universal condemnation of their business practices, clearly believed that their actions had been unfairly judged. Catherine Williams, director of Butterfield's books, manuscripts, and entertainment memorabilia, complained in an account published in Black Issues in Higher Education, April 11, 2002, quote, we have to remember that this stuff was saved by a guy looking for furniture and ended up with these banker's boxes full of papers. But if there hadn't been a buyer, the boxes would have been tossed. If the buyer hadn't looked at the papers, hadn't understood their significance, they would have been tossed. It's terrifying to think of what the world came cl so close to losing, unquote. On narrow technical grounds, two days, Attorney Fleming was able to regain legal control of the archives from both PSI and Butterfield. After considering their options, the Shabazz daughters decided to place the property on long-term loan with the Schaumburg. As the media attention died down, troubling questions still remain. Malika Shabazz continued to this day to deny any personal responsibility or involvement for the relocation of her father's memorabilia to the Florida Storage Warehouse. If these rare materials had been stored primarily in the family basement for years, it does seem it would have been relatively a simple matter to hire an appraiser to make an academic as well as a commercial evaluation of the property. At the home, bids could have been easily solicited. Why all the unnecessary public drama? Why the public humiliation of having to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to retrieve something from public auction that had been stored away in your own basement. Then my thoughts turned to journalist Alex Haley, co-author of the autobiography of Malcolm X, and subsequently author of the best-selling Roots. Haley was widely recognized before his death in 1992 as the best-selling black author in U.S. history. Haley, more than anyone else, should have understood the historic significance of Malcolm's memorabilia lodged in Betty's basement. He was godfather to Malcolm's oldest daughter, Adela, and a close family friend for more than a quarter century after the assassination. Why had Haley not acted decisively to preserve Malcolm's legacy, keeping black history off the auction block? Because there is no comprehensive archive of Malcolm's writings, correspondence, and personal items, it's fragmented and located in 71 different universities and archival sites that I can count. Much of what is popularly appreciated about him is derived from, primarily from the Autobiography of Malcolm X. Published by Grove Press in November 1965, the book was the product of a unique collaboration or an uneasy partnership between the black nationalist leader and Haley, a recently retired veteran from the Coast Guard and feature stories writer. The two men were politically a continent apart from each other. Haley was, throughout most of his life, a Republican and a strong advocate of racial integration. Haley knew relatively little about the rich and very complex histories of both black nationalism 
and the various religious organizations and sects in the United States that were affiliated or identified with Islam throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. At their first meeting in Harlem in 1959, Malcolm quickly sized Haley up and declared without apologies, quote, you're another one of the white man's tools sent to spy, unquote. Malcolm had no idea how true his initial impressions were. Haley's first published article on the Nation of Islam, Mr. Muhammad Speaks, appeared in the March 1960 issue of Reader's Digest. The article was a relatively accurate presentation of the NOI's activities and views. Haley's purpose, however, was to make the argument for integration to, to a Reader's Digest mostly white audience. Quote, it is important for Christianity and democracy to help remove the Negro's honest grievances and thus eliminate the appeal of such a potent racist cult. Haley's article concludes. Haley planned a follow-up piece on the NOI for the Saturday Evening Post in 1962 with white writer Alfred Bull. The interracial team traveled throughout the country for a period of several months interviewing NOI leaders and attending its public events. In early October 1962, Ball contacted the FBI, explaining that he and Haley were writing an article on the organization, and he requested the Bureau's cooperation. On October 9, 1962, Balk was interviewed by an agent of the Bureau's crime research section. Balk explained that his article with Haley, while providing, quote, an accurate and realistic appraisal of the NOI, unquote, would emphasize that, quote, many of the statements about the successes of the NOI among the Negro people are also highly exaggerated. Now, this is from the FBI's internal documents. The article that subsequently appeared in early 1963 entitled Black Merchants of Hate described the group as, quote, a tightly knit Negro extremist sect. The article stated, started with a detailed description of the dramatic events in Harlem, and if anyone saw, read the autobiography, or saw Spike Lee's film, you'll know instantly about Johnson Hinton and the incident that occurred on the evening of April the 26th, 1957, in Harlem, where an NOI member... Johnson Hinton, ex Hinton, was brutally beaten, jailed by New York City police officers. Hinton's beaten, beating drew hundreds of African Americans into the streets outside the 123rd Street police station, protesting his mistreatment. The scene, now made famous by Fi Spike Lee's film, illustrated the young black nationalist leader's tremendous authority and persuasive power. The police captain said, that's too much power for any one man to have. But the article also criticized other published reports, placing the NOI's membership at roughly between 100 to 250,000. Estimated its hard core at only 5,500 to 6,000 members with another estimated 50,000 people who were sympathetic to the cause. It praised NOI-affiliated businesses as, quote, clean and well-run, but noted that, quote, most are owned by membership and not by the movement. The total accumulated by the sect is only a fraction of that owned by the late Daddy Grace or Father Divine, unquote. At the conclusion, Haley and Balk cited a quotation from the Little Rock, Arkansas newspaper editor, Harry Ashmore, which had sided much to its peril with the forces of desegregation in the Little Rock struggle several years earlier. Ashmore expressed their views through the following language, quote, the black Muslims are a warning to which churches, community leaders, and public officials better pay heed. The masses of Negro people no longer are willing to stand still. That injustice has been done and change is going to come. The only question is, will the change come 
through men and women working together, regardless of race, or will the field be left to extremists? The importance of the Haley Balk piece can hardly be overemphasized because it provides the crucial template for the vast majority of all commercially oriented and much of the scholarly literature to be produced on Malcolm X flowing over the next four decades. First, both the FBI and the NOI were generally pleased with the peace for different reasons. An internal FBI memo dated February the 6th, 1963, confirms that Haley and Balk agreed to recycle information directly from the Bureau into their published article. The memo states that the article's objective, the Bureau's objective, is, quote, to present the NOI to responsible citizens in its proper light enabling the FBI to elicit cooperation from citizens and thereby carrying out the FBI's investigative responsibilities, unquote. Malcolm X's autobiography has most of the elements that are presented in outline form in the Balk Haley piece. Malcolm is described in the short essay, as, quote, a lanky, energetic, good-looking man, once known in Harlem as Detroit Red, Big Red. Malcolm is presented as the son of, quote, an uneducated Baptist preacher, a former numbers runner, quote, hustler of bootleg whiskey and dope, an ex-convict, quote, articulate, single-minded, the fire of bitterness still burns in his soul. Malcolm X travels the country. Many Muslims feel that Malcolm is too powerful to be denied the leadership of the NOI if he wants it. Now, either the FBI or Balk or Haley or all three were re deliberately reinforcing through the essay the tensions already existing inside of the NOI, pushing the thesis that Malcolm desired hegemonic control of the organization. My biography in progress on Malcolm attempts to outline in much greater detail the origins and development of the autobiography of Malcolm X and the frequently contentious relationship between these two authors. What can be said here and now is that all autobiographies are indeed reconstructions of a person's life drawn principally upon one's memory which is always subjective, selective, and fragmentary. The book's emphasis on Malcolm's pre-Nation of Islam years as a depraved criminal and as notorious outlaw in Roxbury and Harlem, nearly beyond redemption, is without question an extreme over-exaggeration designed to illustrate from Malcolm's point of view the spiritual transformation he had experienced in submitting himself to the faith represented by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The book was based on a series of taped conversations taking place over several years, and to a great extent reflects some level compromises, negotiations between the two men. The original manuscript auctioned to private owners by the Haley Estate in 1992 shows extensive revisions and edited notations by Malcolm over the organization and selection of details about his life. Furthermore, although Haley grew to admire his subject, he was always deeply hostile to Malcolm's politics. Haley, as a writer, was primarily attracted to Malcolm's dramatic moments of epiphany, his conversion experience first in the Nation of Islam, then subsequently during his 1964 trip to Mecca. This emphasis helps to make the autobiography, an outstanding narrative that has continued to appeal to a universal audience. But its very appeal for these reasons, not unlike Frederick Douglass's autobiographies, make it less than reliable concerning important details about his life. The basic approach agreed upon by the FBI in bulk in 1962 
to give a reasonably accurate depiction of the NOI, but to represent the black separatist group as a product of America's failure to implement integration within the framework of the existing system was Haley's consistent, overriding, ideological objective. Any important information that seemed to divert from that central thesis was deleted from the narrative. For example, in July 1959, Malcolm traveled extensively throughout the Middle East and Africa. He even met with Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser and spent time hanging out with then Deputy Prime Minister Anwar el-Sadat in Cairo. He visited Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, the Sudan, Ghana, and possibly, we still have to nail this down, Syria and Iran. On July 26, 1959, at the St. Nicholas Arena in Harlem, Malcolm had returned, and he informed his Harlem audience about his extensive travels throughout Africa and the Mideast. He even explained that he had tentatively planned to visit Mecca. The Hajj to Mecca, he asserted, unfortunately had to be changed due to an illness. Yet the autobiography barely mentions Malcolm's 1959 journey, giving this important excursion exactly one sentence. Lee's film deletes it entirely. Both the film and the autobiography emphasize the central significance of the April-May 1964 travels to Mecca and beyond as a spiritual racial metamorphosis, a vivid illustration of the colorblind unity of humankind, which then becomes Malcolm's compass. This is, frankly, playing fast and loose with history. Malcolm had been there and nearly seen all of it before. In 1959, he returned from the Mideast, still a committed, confirmed, dogmatic black nationalist and racial separatist. But in 64, according to Haley's interpretation, Malcolm completely rejected the racism and extremism of his former self due to his new exposure to peoples and cultures outside of the United States. Throughout the construction of the autobiography, both during the period when Malcolm was alive, but especially after he was gone, Haley, his book agent, Paul Reynolds, and the publishing executives at the publishing house that first commissioned the property, Doubleday, chatted extensively, unbelievable literature, about the manuscript. They reworked the text. They altered names, events, and other information that suited their collective purposes. Malcolm was out of the loop on all of these conversations. In August 1964, most of the book manuscript was given to George C. Shively, a partner in the Park Avenue law firm of Satterley, Warwick, and Stevens, for a close reading and a determination for potentially legal repercussions that might follow the book's publication. A young attorney William O. Dwyer, carefully reviewed, who later had a political career in New York, reviewed the manuscript for Shively, and by mid-September, Dwyer had identified extensive changes that must be made to avoid potential libel suits. On September 24, 1964, worried executives at Doubleday contacted Haley about, quote, potentially actionable statements in the book. There was clearly, quote, an element of risk involved, and you, Malcolm X and Doubleday, must jointly agree how much risk to take as we are equally responsible in the eyes of the law, unquote. On November 8, 1964, Haley contacted Doubleday executives highlighting the significance of Malcolm's recent conversion to Orthodox Islam and the necessity, Haley argued, quote, to quickly write a new last two chapters, which I am set to do once I can hands on Malcolm. Haley gushed with enthusiasm, quote, talk about a full circle book. This will be it. 
from the toughest anti-white demagogue the land has ever produced to now all men are brothers, unquote. Don't kill me, that's Haley. Only days following Malcolm's assassination, Doubleday editors decided, decided to merge Haley's final two chapters into one chapter. Haley, in turn, gave Doubleday the authority, quote, blanket permission to change any material you deem libelous, unquote. This correspondence absolutely confirms that Malcolm did not have the opportunity to read, review, or authorize the final text that bears his name. And as I mentioned yesterday, three chapters produced by Malcolm and Haley in their collaboration in late 63 never made the final cut. And you've never seen them. They're in a safe in Detroit, in an attorney's office. At the end, the final version of the autobiography that reached the public in late 65 essentially represents three distinctly different books produced for very different purposes by enormously different people. There is what can be described as the core text the black nationalist, of black nationalist orientation. Chapters 1 through 14, depicting Malcolm's fall into degradation, his prison experience, salvation by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. These chapters were the product of the Haley-Malcolm collaboration between June through November 1963, prior to Malcolm's silencing and his subsequent break from the NOI in March of 64. The second book, chapters 15 through 19, is significantly shorter than the first. 118 pages to 270 pages. It documents Malcolm's humanistic metamorphosis. Much of that text was written during the period when Malcolm's, Malcolm was either out of the country or after his death. Malcolm X was at this moment under constant death threats. He was attempting to build a militant political formation, the OAAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, he had at best a limited opportunity to closely review what would be widely taken for his political testament. This may help to explain why there are, is virtually no specific discussion in the autobiography about practical concrete measures and a program for the implementation of black nationalism in the African American community. The actual language at times clearly comes more from Haley than Malcolm. Following the basic template established in consultation with the FBI in late 1962. As I mentioned, three chapters of the core text were removed through the process outlining a plan for creating a broad black united front under the NOI aegis, working collaboratively even with blacks from the NAACP and other integrationist groups, completely removed from the book. But this was not enough for Haley to make it absolutely clear that Malcolm had become, in effect, an integrationist. Haley inserted a third book, almost as long as the second, consisting of his lengthy epilogue, pages 390 to 463, and an introduction by New York Times reporter M.S. Handler, who had covered Malcolm extensively for his newspaper. In Handler's introduction, the journalist argues that Malcolm had indeed experienced, quote, a conversion to wider horizons. For Handler, Malcolm X was rapidly moving toward a, quote, new approach, which in essence recognized the Negroes as an integral part of the American community, a far cry from Elijah Muhammad's doctrine of separation. He no longer invaded against the United States, but against a segment of the United States represented by overt white supremacists in the South and covert white supremacists in the North. What did Haley actually think of Malcolm? In a candid admission just before his death to Thomas Hauser, author of Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times, Haley expressed the opinion that both Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were both highly overrated as leaders. Both men, he explained, quote, died tragically about 
at about the right time in terms of posterity. Both men were at a point in their careers where they were beginning to decline. They were under attack. King was having problems keeping his thing together. Malcolm X, maybe even more graphically, had lost his power base. And Malcolm, I know, was having a rough time trying to keep things going. Most of them were killed just before it really went downhill for them. And after their death, they were practically sentenced. With the publication and nearly universal praise generated by the autobiography, the, commercial, the commoditization of Malcolm X began. Brutal photos depicting Malcolm's body at the assassination were inserted into the first edition without consulting the family, put in the finished book. For years, Ilyasa was literally unable to open the text because of its horrific, grisly depictions of her father's mutilated body in the bloody murder scene. Quickly, Malcolm X's value as a commercial commodity rested less on what he actually thought and did, but rather on how he was represented within the commercial marketplace. Texts of the actual transcripts of the majority of his speeches went unpublished in decades and still remain unavailable. His primary source documents, the personal diary, his correspondence, political texts, were stacked in dusty piles rotting away in the basement of Betty's Mount Vernon, New York, suburban home. By the early 90s, the autobiography had earned both Haley and the Shabazz estate millions of dollars in royalties, and the book was widely recognized by scholars as a classic text in American literature. In 30 years, about 3 million copies had been printed worldwide. Time magazine in 1998 ranked the autobiography the most, among the most influential nonfiction works of the 20th century. In recognition of Malcolm's significance in the making of modern American life, as a symbolic gesture perhaps to his in full incorporation into the pantheon of American heroes, the U.S. Postal Service announced a Malcolm X postage stamp. Critics in Harlem said that's the only way the U.S. government finally was able to lick Malcolm X. <laughs> Malcolm's rhetoric and dynamic use of language has been the subject of several hundred scholarly papers over the years. Prominent African-American scholar Henry Louis Gates, Jr., for example, isolated Malcolm's original contributions with the observation, quote, more than Martin Luther King, Jr., more than any of the black nationalist neo-Marxists, Malcolm X was a writer, a wordsmith, unquote. Skips right. Yet apparently, few scholars of our generation were prepared to address the difficult task of attempting to reconstruct his actual life from primary source materials. In retrospect, Haley made no effort to preserve Malcolm's actual archives because he had a material interest in maintaining the status quo, preserving the popular representation he had successfully constructed. The major edited collections of Malcolm's speeches, including Malcolm X Speaks and By Any Means Necessary, were published by Pathfinder Press and Merit Publications which are affiliated presses with the Trotskyist Socialist Workers' Party, SWP. The Trotskyists, following the Marxist theories of Leon Trotsky, believed that the revolutionary black nationalism represented by militants like Malcolm was a necessary precursor to the staging of a successful socialist revolutionary project in the United States. Trotskyists went out of their way in, 60, in 64 and 5 to court and promote Malcolm after his break from the NOI and in many respects interpreted his ideas and goals as part of an evolution within the black freedom struggle toward a revolutionary socialist position. It has not been established if the SWP edited the speeches to emphasize particular views conforming most favorably to their own dogmatic perspectives. 
what is indisputable and what we have found in our project is that Brightman, who was the editor and chief interpreter of Malcolm, never actually met the man himself. And that even the most famous speeches Malcolm delivered Message to the grassroots in Detroit on November 10th, 1963, have only appeared in print in versions that were heavily edited with major passes completely redacted. The audio recording of Message to the Grassroots that was released on a 16-inch record has many sound gaps and obvious deletions, some of which have been attributed to Malcolm himself who asked for the deletion of any and all favorable references he had made several months earlier on the original to Elijah Muhammad. Consequently, millions of activists who have read and who can quote, quote from memory from the writings of Malcolm are really unfamiliar with what the man actually said. For the black generation born after the civil rights and black power period, its introduction to Malcolm X came largely, however, from two cultural sources. Spike Lee's 1992 biopic, X, or Malcolm X, and hip hop culture's expropriation of Malcolm as its revolutionary muse to propagate a politically engaged aesthetic. Lee's film presented itself as a type of historical construction designed for a popular audience, much in the same ways that the autobiography does, but in virtually every respect failed as any kind of credible account of Malcolm's life. Presented in 201 minutes, the film related Malcolm's life as a three-part play. His Detroit red hustler phase in Harlem and Roxbury, his spiritual metamorphosis inside prison and emergence as Minister Malcolm X, leader of the NOI's Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem, and finally, his journey toward true Islam and a humanistic philosophy informed by his continuing commitment to human and black liberation. To Lee's credit, the film drew heavily upon the actual words of Malcolm in numerous scenes, so much so that one critic of the New York Times criticized it as, quote, a tedious history lesson as opposed to dramatic entertainment. But relating the complex story of any historical figure's life in film necessitates a number of factual changes, such as the creation of composite figures. Several figures who were critically important in Malcolm's life, none more so than his half-sister, Ella Collins, do not even appear and are not even mentioned in the film. Following Haley's lead, Lee minimizes the active role of the federal government in fostering disinformation between Malcolm's organization of Afro-American unity and the NOI, which directly contributed to his death. More disturbing, however, was the highly commercialized character of the film's promotion, which shamelessly turned the black leader into a commercial franchise. As film studies scholar Thomas Doherty has noted, Malcolm X the movie was overshadowed by Malcolm the product. A flood of X brand commodities appeared almost everywhere during 1992-93, including X brand potato chips. Even President Bill Clinton was seen jogging jauntily from the White House, proudly sporting a stylish X cap on his head. Perhaps the most faithful commercialized representation then of Malcolm X, at least from the standpoint of attempting to present a culturally and politically authentic expression of the man's meaning culturally to his people, is to be found in music and the arts. Given the chaotic helter-skelter life that Malcolm led, this should not be entirely surprising. My colleague and historian Robin Kelly, in his interview with our project, creatively suggested that Malcolm ought to be thought of as a typical musician, an artist traveling constantly on the go, on the road, two or three hundred days a year, sleeping in strange quarters, dealing with the stress of performances several times daily, night after night. Malcolm's instrument was, of course, his powerful voice. Solid argument can be made that what Malcolm was attempting to do within black America, the delegitimation of white hegemonic standards of beauty and power and the reclamation of a black identity was 
that was culturally connected with Africa and the Third World is exactly what the revolutionary musicians like Charles Mingus, Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, and Sun Ra were also attempting to achieve. In black music, our friend Amiri Baraka relates that Coltrane was, quote, a mature swan whose wingspan was the whole new world. But he also showed us how to murder the popular song and to do away with weak Western forms, unquote. That's Amiri. Harmony, or the musical expression of integrationism, harmony, was rejected to the dynamic, unfettered rhythms and melodies of an African people searching for the dignity and for the fullest meaning of hum humanity. By renouncing Western art forms, the black nationalist or separatist approach allows artists to reclaim African musical forms. One might say that Malcolm's passionate lectures about the crimes against Patrice Lumumba's struggles against Belgian colonialism in the Congo tried to do and accomplish the same thing. Even if the autobiography had never been published, Malcolm's striking image and powerful rhetoric might have been continued to resonate in various artistic expressions. Coltrane's Afro Blue, recorded soon after the, the assassination, may have partially been inspired as a tribute to Brother Malcolm. It is easy to hear the themes of many of Malcolm's speeches, direct and indirect, from Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Bob Marley and Peter Tosh's Get Up, Stand Up, Marley's Africa Unite, and Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. In the 1988 song Cult of Personality by the group Living Color, excerpts of Malcolm's voice are used to emphasize the necessity to challenge oppressive institutions and to advocate the necessity to think and live as free people. Popular white folk singer Annie DeFranco's 1999 song, To the Teeth, draws upon Malcolm's controversial comments following the 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy as a means to condemn the burden of racial and class injustices. Quote, he said the chickens would come home to roost. Malcolm forecast the flood. Are we really going to sleep through another century while the rich profit off our blood? Rage against the machines, renegades of funk, lists both King and Malcolm as renegades of our time and age, so many renegades. In Phony Franchise, the group Dell, the funk Funkadelic Homo sapien, the funky Homo sapien, rather, flipped back to the late 70s celebrates the pre-Nation of Islam Malcolm, the hustler Detroit Red, quote, remember Malcolm X wore a pimp hat, unquote. The examples of hip-hop artists sampling Malcolm's speeches, expropriating his style, incorporating language, are endless, beginning back in 83 with no sellout, in which Malcolm is actually listed as a co-writer. Most of the artists and groups who comprised what many critics now described as hip-hop music's golden age, about 1987 to 93, Public Enemy, N.W.A., employed Malcolm's image and his fiery word to express their own militant, artistic, and political messages and convictions. In Making Malcolm, published in 1995, Michael Eric Dyson correctly attributed Malcolm's continuing attraction as a unique, black cultural icon to, quote, the characteristic quest in black America, the search for a secure and empowering black male figure. This is, of course, raises the obvious question of what Betty Shabazz actually thought about her husband. Part of the explanation why Shabazz did nothing to catalog and preserve Malcolm's papers may have come to light in June 2002 shortly after the Butterfield's abortive auction. Moments in Time, a company that sells rare manuscripts, famous signatures, and unusual memorabilia, advertised the availability for sale of a four-page single-space letter written by Malcolm X and addressed to Elijah Muhammad, dated March 25, 1959. 
the company made available a reproduction of the letter on the Internet, describing the document as, quote, the most exceptional letter of Malcolm X ever to hit the market. The contents of the letter detailed the marital and sexual problems Malcolm was experiencing with his young wife of then two years, Betty. The letter states that Malcolm had been extremely reluctant to become married, and he vigorously denied whispered accusations throughout the NOI that he had been sexually engaged with several prominent female members. Quote, I stayed single for a long time because I knew my own weaknesses and shortcomings. When I did marry, it was at a time of great mental and spiritual weakness on my part, unquote. The letter revealed that soon after marriage, the relationship qui quickly drifted, quote, downhill. Malcolm complained to his mentor about his spouse's, quote, luxurious taste, which I immediately began to curb, unquote. But the underlying tension between the young couple, Malcolm admitted, was sexual. In frank and surprisingly explicit detail, the letter describes certain sexual intimacies about Betty's profound unhappiness and lack of fulfillment with Malcolm's lovemaking. The international media, of course, immediately picked up on the story and predictably put its own perverse spin on the revelations. The New Zealand-based New Truth and TV Extra Media Group reported that, quote, Malcolm X inspired a generation of black Americans to fight for their rights, but he couldn't inspire his wife. The New Zealand media emphasized Malcolm's wife had, quote, an insatiable appetite for sex. The London-based independent journalist Shoto Burns speculated, quote, the letter is on sale for $125,000. I imagine Mal uh, Muhammad's advice on how to get things up at home would fetch a similar sum. The New York Post reported the sexual revelations under the bold front page headline, Malcolm X's Sexual Suffering. Critics of the letter released promptly protested that intimate sexual details of Malcolm and Betty were completely irrelevant to a historical appreciation of the content of their lives. One black historian, William Jelani Ka, protested on the internet that, quote, one's right to privacy does not end with death. I fail to see the significance of Betty and Malcolm's sex life in our understanding of a pan-Africanist visionary, unquote. As a general rule, Cobb's argument makes sense. But details about a historical figure's intimate personal relationships, even their sexual preferences, are important factors in a full human portrait of any individual. Jimmy Baldwin's well-known homosexuality was a central dimension of his personality and in how he lived his life and ultimately how he defined his art and politics. Martin's now widely reported enormous sexual appetites for women may appear to add little to our understanding of his politics. But one must also acknowledge that the personal is always ultimately political. There are no absolute boundaries separating the sexual needs and the desires of individuals from the roles they attempt to play in public life and in how they relate to other human beings in other very intimate ways. Therefore, any serious study of Malcolm would be incomplete without a full and serious examination of his complicated relationships with his wife, his children, siblings, relatives, and his closest associates, the people he worked with. There is much that is already known about the difficulties within Malcolm's marriage to Betty Chabez. In the autobiography, Malcolm openly revealed misogynistic, patriarchal views about women in general, and serious misgivings about his wife. When he was first released from prison and became a Muslim minister, Malcolm X was firmly convinced in his own words, quote, 
that a woman's true nature is to be weak, that any man, quote, must control his woman if he expects to get her respect. During one interview with Haley, Malcolm observed, quote, you can never fully trust any woman. I've got the only one that I've ever met that I would trust 75%. I've told her that. I've seen too many men destroyed by their wives or their women. The couple quarreled constantly about money and later about issues of family security. Malcolm later admitted to, that Betty, in turn, had insisted that Malcolm, quote, should put away something for our family, but I refused. Malcolm had convinced himself that, quote, if anything ever happened to me, the Nation of Islam will take care of her for the rest of her life and our children until they are grown. Only later did Malcolm X sadly recognize his critical error. Quote, I, have, I could never have been a bigger fool. Betty's serious difficulties with her husband prompted her to seek separations from him on three different occasions, each after the births of their three oldest children, Adela in 1958, Kabila in 1960, and Ilyasa, born in 1962. Even at the end of his life, it was hard for Malcolm to talk completely, openly, with confidence about his feelings for his wife. Quote, he says in the autobiography, I guess by now I will say I love Betty. The Moments in Time letter makes clear that Malcolm did not want to get married. But the social expectations of his role as a minister pressured him into hasty matrimony. Malcolm X researcher Carl Evans suggests that Malcolm had, prior to his marriage to Betty X, had been attracted to another woman in Temple No. 7, Evelyn X, Evelyn X Williams. Supposedly, when Evelyn X was informed about Malcolm's unexpected marriage to Betty X, she left the temple in tears. Elijah Muhammad then became sexually involved with her, with her. As Evelyn X. Williams later informed the press in 1964, quote, Elijah Muhammad told us that under the teaching of the Holy Quran, we were not committing adultery and that we were his wives. Malcolm may have not completely been surprised, therefore, by the sexual relationship culminating in the two pregnancies, developing between Evelyn and his mentor. Indeed, he later admitted in the autobiography that, quote, as far back as 1955, I had heard hints about Muhammad's serial adultery. But the deep ambivalence he felt about marriage in general, the problems that Betty had with his controlling and patriarchal behavior, probably could not have sustained a strong trusting relationship between the two, which is possibly the reason that when Betty broke from the NOI and created the OAAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, he laid down strict limits on Betty's attendance and involvement inside the new group. In fact, when you interview the eyewitnesses to the assassination, they were stunned by the fact that Betty was in the Audubon that afternoon because she almost never attended OAAU meetings. He kept Betty separate from the organization. It is unclear whether Spike knew about this hidden history. And if he did, if he had known, how would Angela Bassett have interpreted these troublesome facts on film? To wrap up, the corporate market, not the black masses, has largely framed Malcolm X in the public consciousness. Even during the 1992, and if you doubt this, even in 1992 urban uprising in Los Angeles, then Vice President Dan Quayle, remember him, informed the press that he had been forced to consult passages from the autobiography of Malcolm X to help him interpret the rage being explained by young black militants. But this is not the end of our story. In late 2001, an idealistic young white American 
John Walker Lind, was captured in a cave by U.S. troops somewhere inside of Afghanistan, along with insurgent Taliban fighters. During his subsequent interrogation, he explained that he had first become a convert to radical Islam by reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. 